Okay, so as we are continuing along here, we see um, we're going to talk a little bit about predation and predators and their prey. Um, and this is one of the driving forces in, um, in the adaptation of organisms is that they are trying to evolve ways uh, or they are evolving ways to be adapted to their environment so that they are not eaten or so that they are better able to eat what they want to. So uh, predation is one of the most important forces shaping the composition and abundance of species in our community. Um, and when you think of predation as an interaction between two species in which one um, eats another one, sometimes these are not uh, nearly as obvious as a uh, lion eating a gazelle or a, um, a human eating a cheeseburger. Uh, predation is not restricted to obvious interactions where one animal chases down and kills another one. Um, herbivores eat leaves, fruits, or seeds as a form of predation, uh, even though it doesn't necessarily kill the plant. And uh, predators are not necessarily, excuse me, come up the hiccups. Predators are not necessarily physically imposing. So uh, a mosquito um, is a very dangerous predator that uh, kills more than a million humans each year. Um, but we're not nearly as scared of mosquitoes as we are of sharks or uh, shark attacks, even though um, fewer than a dozen people die of, of shark attacks each year. So um, one of the questions we may ask is why do we have such exotic species out there um, that uh, when released into novel habitats, um, can allow them to survive even though they've not adapted to the new env uh, environment and that's because they're a low predation risk. So um, an example of, uh, of this would be uh, like zebra mussels that were released into Lake Erie. Um, they have uh, spread out so much because um, there isn't anything that is feeding upon them. And so um, there are some mechanisms that organisms have adapted so that they can defend themselves against predators and uh, some of them are physical and some of them are behavioral. So if we look at some physical defenses against predation, um, imagine that if you release a porcupine into a, a novel habitat, um, there's nothing out there that's going to be able to eat a porcupine. So that's a mechanical defense something like a uh, quill or a barb or something spiky. Um, some chemical defenses that organisms have adapted to uh, avoid being eaten is the, um, is the tree frog. And so the tree frog is this bright, beautiful color and it's walking around out in the rainforest and all of the um, species around it have learned that its colorful chemical defense or its poison uh, means that that beautiful coloration shows that it shouldn't be eaten. Um, warning coloration like the monarch butterfly where monarch butterflies are poisonous so birds are not going to um, uh, swerve down and grab these monarch butterflies because uh, they have learned that that uh, coloration uh, means that they're poisonous. And then uh, one of the most obvious physical defenses is uh, camouflage or being able to uh, blend into your environment so that um, things that want to eat you can't see you. Um, so uh, going through those, I kind of talked about them a little bit. Um, prickly spines or armor like on that armadillo, uh, claws, fangs, stingers, other physical structures can help to redu reduce predation risk. So things can't eat them uh, because they physically cannot eat them. Or uh, the chemical defenses have, have evolved, especially um, in plants, because plants are not capable of running away. So they have those bright colorations that show that they're something that shouldn't be eaten because they're something that's poisonous. Um, here we have our monarch butterfly. Um, here are some interesting uh, species 
Um, here we have a monarch butterfly up on the top, and in the bottom picture, we have a viceroy butterfly, and it's a butterfly that has adapted to look just like a monarch butterfly, but a viceroy butterfly isn't poisonous. But if you were a uh, bird that was going to swoop in and eat a butterfly, um, you wouldn't take the time to figure out whether it's a monarch that's poisonous or a viceroy that's non-poisonous. You would be better off to just not eat it. Um, and so that's one of the things that helps to keep the viceroy butterfly around because he mimics a poisonous butterfly. Or if you've ever heard of an eastern coral snake, a coral snake is highly venomous. And uh, the scarlet king snake is non-venomous, uh, but they look very similar to one another. And so if you're going to eat one of those snakes, um, you're definitely, uh, you're probably not going to take the time to figure out whether it's the venomous or the non-venomous one. You're just better off not eating it. Um, and here we have our camouflage. If you're a bird, you're not very likely going to be able to see this critter. And so um, not only do we have mechanical or chemical uh, defenses against predators, sometimes we have behavioral defenses, which may seem passive or seem uh, active. Uh, but here we see a behavioral defense that reduces predation where we have swarming. So this uh, shark can't pick out an individual fish to try and eat because the fish swarm around um, and that helps them to have a better chance at survival. In the next picture you've got a um, octopus that is blowing um, its ink into the water hoping to confuse its predators and have the chance to swip, uh, slip away unnoticed. Um, in the uh, bottom left hand corner we have a bird um, that shoots its stomach contents out at predators hoping to get stomach acid all over them and the predator would be grossed out and not eat the, the bird. And um, in the bottom right hand corner we have the um, horny toad from Texas um, which can shoot blood out of its eye and so the predator becomes so confused and the um, horny toad gets the chance to get away. And so these are some behavioral defenses that reduce predation risk. And um, here's another really interesting predator that has evolved an adaptation so that it can lure its uh, prey into its mouth. So this is called an anglerfish and it has this luminous structure which means uh, it lives way down in the dark deep of the ocean but it's evolved a lighted structure on its head uh, that tricks prey into coming uh, into his mouth and um, then they get, uh, they get eaten. And so those are some kind of fun videos to watch on YouTube if you, uh, if you get a chance. So we may ask the question, why don't predators become so efficient at capturing prey that they drive prey to extinction? The answer to this is the life as dinner hypothesis. So uh, when a prey such as a rabbit, for example, can't escape from a fox, the cost is its life and it will never reproduce that again. On the other hand, when a fox can't keep up with a rabbit, all it loses is a meal. It can still go on to capture other prey and reproduce in the future. So the cost of losing in the interaction is much higher for the rabbit. So if you are uh, losing your life and not capable of passing on your, um, your genes to your offspring, then that's a very uh, costly uh, adaptation. And so uh, then we get into uh, parasitism as a form of predation. Um, up at the top we see a tick uh, that is a parasite that uh, latches onto skin and burrows into skin and sucks the blood out. Um, so ectoparasites live on the outside of their host. And something that is an endoparasite, something that lives inside of the host. So for example, here we have a worm that's, uh, that's in the, uh, with the blood cells of the host. And um, one of the things that you have to remember about parasites is that if a parasite evolves a behavior that allows it to be so good at survival um, that it kills the host, that actually is not a helpful or beneficial um, adaptation because if the parasite kills the host, then the parasite dies too. 
So um, there's all kinds of parasites out there that are um, existing without killing their hosts. And so um, we have uh, parasite as a predator. Uh, parasites have some unique features and face some unusual challenges. The parasite is generally much smaller than its host and stays in contact with the host for an extended period of time. So a parasite is something that lives on its host for an extended period of time. And it has a very complicated life cycle. If you have ever had a dog that's had worms, um, you have to have the dog going outside and, um, and getting near feces that's infected with the worm eggs and ingesting them, and then um, the the uh, worms reproduce inside of the dog and are eventually passed through in the feces to the outside of the dog. So really complicated life cycles that are actually um, really kind of creepy to think about. Um, and I will stop this one here.